civil engineers have learned to work together, to work with each other, and build um, uh, uh, towards a better um, management for patients who come in under us. So my specialty is uh, uh, pediatric hemato-oncology. It's not at all a glamorous specialty. Every day we are uh, put in situations where every single gray cell of our brain is being tested. What should we do for this particular patient? And we have to think what is best, what is latest, especially with technology. Most of the mothers and fathers have already Googled what they want to know about the disease and come and ask us, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? This is what they do in the US. This is what they do in Europe. And also, we have to deal with a lot of emotions and the cost of cancer care. So everything put together, I want to say over the last 15 years, take you through my journey about how it has been to be a physician involved in the treatment of children with uh, childhood uh, blood disorders, especially cancer, and how it has evolved as a specialty, how technology has changed it as a specialty, and also how it has changed me as a physician and as a human being and made me a better human being, I would say. So um, the most important message of today's talk would be that childhood cancers are curable. There are several different types of cancers that children have, but all of them have better cure rates than adults. I want to just go through how technology has helped improve this particular um, cancer that we treat in children called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So in this era, in the 1960s, when I was born, if I was, had the misfortune to have been diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it would have been a miracle for me to survive. Very few children survived, and uh, there was no um, therapy that was offered that would be curative. If you were lucky and your immune system could fight the cancer itself, you came out alive. But as decades went by, the cure rates went up and up and up. And how are we able to achieve the current day results, which are upwards of 85%? It's all related to technology. And the most important technology that we've achieved, more than the medications that we have to treat the same drugs that we had in the 60s, we have as of today. Nothing much has changed. But the existing medications we are putting to better use because across the globe, we have learned to share data. So all patients are put along similar uh, protocols, the children's oncology group in the Americas, the BFM group across Europe, the UK MRC protocol, all of them collect data. This, these are the medications we gave. These are the outcomes. And that has made, made a huge impact. And from childhood malignancies, adults have also copied it, moved into the world of adult oncology and made huge differences in the outcome. So we look at a child and the biology of the disease in the child is different and the biology of the leukemia is different. That is what we have learned. So each individual child, it's not the same leukemia. Some do better than others. We call males the weaker sex because boys do worse compared to girls, for instance. And the leukemic cells also have their own individual features. Some features are good, some features are bad. And this we learned through the big trial groups because we know that some leukemic features, the children have very good outcomes, over 90%, and some of them, the outcomes are very low. So by the end of the first week of treatment, we are able to put the children in little groups where we say these children would do well, these children would do badly. So the children that would do well, you continue along the treatment protocol that we have started off with, those who are going to do badly, we increase their treatment up front so that all of them eventually are going to have the same good outcome and not uh, figure out after a long time why some are doing better and some are doing badly. This is where engineering has really helped us because uh, technology we now have to look at minuscule amounts of cancer cells. This is called minimal residual disease. It has had a huge impact on the way we treat cancers. So for instance, the same acute lymphoblastic leukemia, these are the leukemic cells. We have a machine called the flow cytometry, and we look at the leukemic cells. Each individual dot is a leukemic cell. So on day one, you can see the leukemic cell burden is very huge. So four weeks later, we look at them. 
very, very tiny. So if the rate of disappearance of the leukemic cells are good, then we know that these are patients are going to do quite well. And we can look at the same leukemic burden using another technology called polymerase chain reaction, where a tiny amount of DNA from the leukemic cells can be amplified several fold and followed up serially. So on the first day, if the child had this amount of leukemic cells, 28th day, almost missing band. So this has a huge impact to say those who don't have residual disease are going to do well, so we don't need to give them overtreat them. And those who are going to do badly, we step up treatment initially so that we can give the same good outcomes to all of the children. So yes, there is a good way now to look at a tiny needle in a haystack, which we didn't have before. And I feel that the uh, technology has helped us achieve this. Another kind of cancer that we treat is called Hodgkin's lymphoma. So previously, a lot of the children used to come with lymph gland swelling, and we used to biopsy them or do x-rays or CT scans, give two cycles of treatment, and then do another CT scan. The mass would have shrunk, say, by 50% or by 75%. What is left behind, we didn't have any idea. Are these active cancer cells, or are they uh, dead cancer cells? Because if they're still active cancer cells, we have to add radiotherapy. If we didn't have active cancer cells, then just continuing chemotherapy is good enough. Why is it a big deal? Why can't we give radiotherapy to everyone? It does have an impact on the particular child because we have to remember that nowadays we are talking of cure. We want cure as intact cure. Nobody wants to be left behind as a survivor with some complications of the treatment that they've been through. So if we have radiation to the chest in young girls, they were more prone to breast cancers later. They had thyroid problems because these areas were also exposed during radiation. So we now have this amazing tool called PET CT scan. And this PET CT scan is able to differentiate which are the areas of active cancer cells and which are the areas which are not lighting up. So it may be swollen, the gland, but it's not taking up the uh, dye. So that means these are dead cancer cells. We don't need to go after them and treat them. And this has made a huge impact on the way we treat lymphomas. And uh, we're seeing better and better results in um, uh, uh, lymphoma uh, treatment. So it helps us reduce late side effects as well. The other technological advance we've had is the cyber knife. I think it's amazing technology. We have moving parts of the body like the lung or the spine and the brain where very, very sensitive tissues are placed side by side to our cancer cells. So we have nerves that uh, control the rest of our body. We have uh, um, uh, parts of the body that we should not irradiate and our cancer cells are sitting very close to these very sensitive areas. So cyber knife technology has really made a difference because the robotic arms help focus the radiation only to the areas of malignancy, leaving behind all the normal tissues in that area. So um, I feel it has had a major impact on the way we treat uh, cancer. This is my area of speciality, use of stem cells. So blood-forming stem cells, we call them as hematopoietic stem cells, and these are there in our bone marrow, and they help make red cells, white cells, and platelets. So this we have used for a long time, since the 1960s, to help cure uh, leukemias that we could not treat with chemotherapy or certain genetic disorders like immune deficiency. And to our surprise, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, we knew that the bone marrow stem cells of the baby is placed in very big amount in human umbilical cord blood. This was a biological waste. And in our own house surgency time, I remember throwing the umbilical cord and placenta away because we thought it was biological waste and it was sent to the incinerator. So this 100 ml cord blood we now know is very rich in stem cells. We have technology that helps us process these stem cells and keep them alive for 25 years in liquid nitrogen. I think it's amazing technology and it has uh, helped save over 10,000 patients worldwide, and they're placed in liquid nitrogen vats to be used at any transplant center across the world. So for instance, we have patients who have 
aplastic anemia or leukemia or immune deficiency or thalassemia, any of the genetic disorders we can treat using uh, uh, stem cells. So it has made the world a small place because this little baby who had uh, immune deficiency, we call them bubble baby. Generations of male babies in their village had, in this family had died of immune deficiency within the first three to four months. The mother had lost two other babies of the same illness. So came from Sri Lanka to India. We found a matched cord blood unit in Taiwan, imported it and uh, did the transplant. And the baby is now doing well one and a half years after transplantation. So this is truly an incredible gift that one mother can give to another mother. So there's another technology where we talk about saving uh, uh, children through stem cells. So I said stem cells need to be matched before they can be put into uh, any person. So the chance of me and my brother being matched is only about 35%. So say, for instance, I come from a family where there is thalassemia. Without my knowledge, I'm a carrier of thalassemia. My husband's a carrier of thalassemia. And the first child, without our knowledge, has been affected with a disease called thalassemia. Every month of this child's life, for the entire life, they need to have blood transfusion. It's a real burden to the family. And in our own country, about 10,000 new births of thalassemia majors happening, and none of us are aware of this condition. So if we have a condition like this, we want to produce this incredible uh, stem cell success story. So what do we do? We don't have a choice. Every next baby has a 25% chance of having the genetic problem and a 30% chance of having a matched donor. So the math is just too scary to go ahead for a natural pregnancy. So here comes the ethics of this new technology called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So this boy had a deadly disease called Fanconi anemia. And their parents in Minnesota had the um, courage to go ahead with the first savior sibling. So this technology is called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The egg and the sperm of the parents are fused, several of them. And when it's only a four-cell stage, we are able to check whether the embryo does not have the disease and is matched for the first baby with the problem and implant that embryo into the mother's womb and then uh, natural pregnancy, cord blood storage, and there is a savior sibling for the first child who has a very bad genetic disease of which they can die. So here, there are ethical questions to the technology that we've embraced. We can go ahead and all have only blonde hair, blue-eyed babies, or all of us want only male children who are very tall. So these are questions that still need to be answered before we embrace this technology in a big way. We also have stem cells that help us form huge cell lines to help us understand rare diseases for which we don't have enough patients. Or instead of using animal experiments, these are cell lines on which we can try our new drugs. So say we are working on a new drug for diabetes. We can have cell lines of pancreatic islet cells and try out different drugs. And these, this is amazing technology with induced pluripotential stem cells, which help drug research. So it has made a huge, it will have a huge impact in the future, I think, without the need for animal experiments. What of um, targeted therapy? Cancer chemotherapy has been very painful. As soon as we give chemotherapy, all of the fast-growing cells of our body die. We lose our hair, we form mouth ulcers, and we have uh, tremendous gut toxicity. So do we have drugs that can only target the cancer cells? That would be amazing. The rest of the body is spared. So we have this condition called chronic myeloid leukemia, where a small gene change sec helps secrete excess tyrosine kinase. And these enzymes keep telling the cells, divide, divide, divide. So we have this amazing drug where technology has helped us get this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, only affecting cancer cells, not affecting the rest of the body. The, the patients who are on this drug, very beautiful, taking a tablet like for hypertension or any other disorder and carrying on with their normal life for what used to be a life-threatening cancer. So the problem here is that a drug costs 100,000 rupees a month. So not everyone can afford it. So here in India, we have the debate on the use of generics, how we are getting drugs that can are used in the West that have come through years of research 
pouring in hundreds of thousands of dollars and we are able to produce these drugs at a fraction of the cost, but hey, it does help save lives here. So we always are uh, mindful of what is the cost of the innovation and the technology that we are offering to patients because most of our country is below the poverty line. So we have our own in innovation, acute myeloid leukemia, the M3 type. Here, only a handful of patients used to survive, and a lot, not, lot, not everyone is able to um, take up the high cost of therapy. So we found that arsenic is a very good drug, which was a poison, which helps move the cancer cells from infancy to uh, teenage to adulthood. These are called differentiating agents rather than killing them off. And that was good enough to help cure. So arsenic trioxide has been used in a lot of trials in India to successfully cure over 90% of AML M3 patients only at a fraction of the cost that we used to treat other malignancies, similar malignancies. So we need to innovate, have more technology that is not so costly but can be applied to the common man in the context of our country. So I want to finish by saying that we need a lot of humility. Working in this field has taught me that not everyone is going to get cured. We need to look at those who we don't cure, find out why we haven't cured them to get better answers. We need to be as a team, not one person, one individual makes a difference. And systems need to be in place and innovations need to be cost effective. Thank you.